Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome to the next level, conversations that propel business. I'm your host, Bob Gibbons. And I'm your host, Stephen Nooner. And uh, we're really excited to be with you guys today. We've got a great guest. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce the next leveler for today. That's what you call when you visit us on the show. Our friend, Bob's and my friend, Kirk Bowman is here with us. He is the visionary of value from the Art of Value. Um, and the Art of Value is a firm focused on helping professional, excuse me, professionals create happy customers and make money. Oh. You mean both can happen at the same time? They better. I guess we're going to find out. Well, um, if you want to learn more about Kirk or the Art of Value, please visit artofvalue.com. Welcome, Kirk. Bob and Steve, thanks for inviting me. It's a joy to be here. Now, if I go to your website, is there any music on it? No. There's not. All right. I, every time I hear Art of Value, I always think of Art of Noise. Do you remember that group from the 80s? I do not. All right. Never mind. Yeah. Moving I don't right either, along. Bob. Well, you're too young, yeah, Stephen. You but I figured go on and pontif- Kirk has a little bit of gray hair in that beard, so I thought he might remember <laughs> them. <laughs> All right. So we like to start off with some wisdom from others. And today, the wisdom is coming from Ron Baker, who was the author of Implementing Value Pricing, Kirk's guru. And his quote is, value is subjective pricing is contextual that sounds very brainy what does it mean to you so my passion is pricing and helping businesses figure out how to use pricing in a positive way to impact revenue profit and income value is subjective as human beings we don't know what something is worth we need to be able to make comparisons and so even if you're selling the same thing to two different companies that are in the same business they're going to perceive value differently. And that's an opportunity to customize whatever you're selling and then also customize the price. So not only is value subjective, but the price is contextual because you're going to set a different price because they perceive value differently. Ah, okay. So Stephen might be willing to pay you double for something that I would because he views the value received from that differently. Correct. Interesting. That's going to be an interesting conversation. Uh, A quote as I was preparing for today that I, I thought was in a similar type vein. It says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Warren Buffett. You know it. <laughs> this man knows his craft. So I, I was speculating that Stephen would be kind of doing this na 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 thing because he's probably thinking, you know, my quote person is, you know, worth more than your quote person. <laughs> we don't all have uh, the, the pride that you do, Bob. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kirk, one of the things I thought was cool about you is uh, looking back at your, your history, there's a couple things about you that's a little unusual in that your first job, th- first thing you got paid for was being a saxophone teacher? Yes. I mean, if you were to ask me what did I want to be when I grew up, I would have said I wanted to be a professional musician. I wanted to play saxophone. I picked up saxophone in sixth grade and majored in music in college. And when I got out, I actually taught and played for the first five years. And so something I still enjoy as a hobby. But, yes, that was my where did, first where career. Where did you play? Um, mostly private parties so like corporate parties weddings those as type a, of things as a soloist or in a band or what it was typically with a group it could be a trio a quartet quintet it depended we would change the style as well as the instrumentation depending on what the customers needs were how fun it was it was I a saw blast so snowboarding in colorado is a hobby yes so i didn't pick up snowboarding until i was 30 and 
I was on a plane with uh, the singles group at church because I wasn't married yet, and the guy next to me looked at me and he said, hey, why don't we pick up snowboarding? I was like, okay, and it became a passion for me. So I love it. I've snowboarded probably 10 different mountains in Colorado, and it's just a passion. So you get in the train with all the youngsters and everything too? Oh, snow train? Yeah. You know, my board stays on the snow. Oh. I don't go airborne. <laughs> oh, then you're not a real snowboarder then. Hey, have you tried ski biking, snow biking? I have seen those, but I have not tried <laughs> I it. did that last year for the first time. It was the best thing I ever did. It is so easy and so much fun. Anyway, so, moving on. Yeah, moving on. So tell us um, about value-based pricing. Is it a methodology, a theology, or both? Well, it's both. So the theology or the theory is what we quoted earlier from Ron. Value is subjective, pricing is contextual. Mm -hmm. It's a business model, really, when you come to apply it to professional services, which is my area of expertise. So accounting, law, software development, creative design, anything where you're using your knowledge and expertise to help the customer achieve a result they could not achieve on their own. It is something that you have to commit to first from a standpoint of belief. Mm -hmm. You have to believe what I quoted from Ron earlier. You have to not only understand it, but believe it and essentially reject competing theories and say, this is the way the world is. So what do you say to the person that says, oh, well, that's unfair. You shouldn't charge one person more than the other for the same service. Like what's the, uh, cause I'm sure y'all get that, that, that they run into that barrier of their own theology of, of whether or not they can implement something like this. The first thing that comes to mind is a parable that Jesus told, okay. the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And he would have workers who showed up at the beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day. And at the end, the workers who showed up at the beginning of the day got paid the same as the end of the day, and they got upset. And Jesus' response was, well, it's my money. <laughs> Who are you to tell me what to do with it? Right. I think if you look at Scripture, this idea of value is throughout Scripture. Because value is really just another word for serving. Sure. Some people think of business as a zero-sum game where in order for one party to win, one party has to lose. Mm -hmm. And I think that is false. I think the best businesses create win-win situations. They focus on value for the customer. The customer wins because they're aligning the business's interest with the customer, but then the customer is happy to compensate the business well because they've achieved something they couldn't otherwise. Sure. So abundance mindset, more everybody can win Exactly. Together. So the professionals that you're talking about, a lot of people view them as being sort of all the same. Uh, lawyer. In fact, I, on the way over here, I had a conversation with a client who's trying to hire an attorney right now. Mm -hmm. And she was complaining because she was going to, you know, her attorney quoted her $300 an hour. And she wanted to know if I had somebody else that would charge less. And I was like, well, I'm sure I can find you somebody that charges less, but he or she may not be an expert in that particular industry. Why not pay a little more for somebody who's going to take less hours to do the same job? And she just wasn't getting the whole idea of value. You know, the thought that comes to mind, the quote that we've probably heard in business for decades is, nobody got fired for hiring IBM. Right. I've also heard an analogy that, you know, if you're being charged with murder, do you want the $500 an hour attorney or the $1,000 an hour attorney? Again, we often say, you get what you pay for. One comment just on the hourly is, I actually believe that that is a business model that is not aligned with pursuing value for the customer. And we can get into that later. But essentially, another piece of advice I would offer to your friend is, why not look for an attorney who will quote you a fixed price? And I think a lot of that sometimes goes back to in that industry, in certain industry. Mine's another example, like where the, the, the way people communicate the value they provide, they don't always have that. So they just say, oh, well, I charge $300 an hour. And, and it, so it's not clear, so then it's almost like they're commoditiz commoditizing yourself. Right. Um, so anyway, I mean, just just a thought. I mean, I, I actually know. do have a, a client who's a lawyer who does do the flat rate, and she, will re she refuses to charge by the hour. And in fact, I told my kids growing up, never charge by the hour. Charge by how much people are willing to pay to not have to do it themselves. And this was when my kids were mowing lawns, doing pet sitting, you know, that kind of stuff. 
but who cares how much it costs per hour? That's, that's an arbitrary metric. How much am I willing to pay to not have to do it myself? You're preaching to the choir, Bob. I completely <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> okay, good. You know, um, But I want to know what you're going to charge me by the hour, Bob. Um, I don't charge by the hour. <laughs> well, that's not true. Anyway, moving right along. Well, one, one question I had one, and I thought was worthwhile for the audience. You didn't just become an expert in this. You, I mean, because you just read a bunch of books. You literally lived this, and it became your life's pursuit and passion out of your own experience. So can you share that journey a little bit? Sure. So the second career that I was in and still am in is software development. I've been in that business for over 20 years, primarily on the custom software end. And in that business, we build by the hour for 15 years. So I know what it means to build by the hour. I know what it's like to come up with your rate. I know what it's like to send an invoice to the customer and hope they pay it, hope they don't call you and go, why'd you spend two hours on this? And then I went to an industry conference and I participated at part of a panel discussion on estimating and billing practices for software developers. The irony is I took the position that hourly was the way to do it. But there was another consultant who said the way to do it is to value price. And that started me on my journey. So how did you make that switch? I took 90 days to study the business model. And what that consultant said that resonated with me is he said, when you bill by the hour, there's an arbitrary limit on your income. And he's right. You can only raise your rate so high. There's only so many hours you can work, et cetera. And I've been an entrepreneur all my life, and so that really just didn't sit well in my soul. I studied the business model, and after 90 days, I said, you know what? We're going to price on value. We're going to stop billing by the hour. It took us a year to switch in our business, and after doing that for multiple years in my software business, I realized I had a passion to help other professionals make the same change. That's awesome. And, I mean, so – I, um, I guess we're going to come back to it, but that couldn't have been easy. I mean, I can see how that could be easy going forward with new business, but how did, what did you do for your existing clients? You're exactly right. It's easy with new customers. It is harder with existing customers. With existing customers, you have to, number one, begin to educate them just through casual conversation. Hey, we are planning to make a business model change. And then look for an opportune time where the current project or scope of work comes to a completion and then walk them through that transition. So one of the things you said many years ago that I heard was really amazing. It kind of shocked me at the time was you gave a proposal to a customer for let's call it $30,000. I'm just going to make up numbers. And they say, that's too much money. Can you do a little better? And your response was, sure. What do you want to cut out? And I was like, what do you mean? What, what, what would I cut? Out? I just want a better price. And you said, no, what service have I offered you that you don't want? Exactly. We don't reduce price or discount without removing value. The idea is that I put an offer on the table for the value that you're going to receive. This is the price that I'm going to charge. If you need that price to come down, that's fine, but we are going to remove something. We're going to take value out. We're not going to discount because discounting by itself devalues what you do. So clearly you've established what the parameters are with that client up front before you ever give them a price in the first place. Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to go to the break, but <clears throat> before we do, uh, so we're going to, when you... <laughs> That's All right. right, we're about to go to a break, and when we come back, we're going to ask Kirk to provide some feedback on a real-life business situation provided by a listener. Stick around. And now, Confessions of a Recovering Landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease, because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases, while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. Don't let landlords have all the power. As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? 
Hi, I'm Steven Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy, one that you can articulate, or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. This is Parker Entz from Dental Warranty, and I just want to let you know, I think the Stephen Bob show is very entertaining, but if they put you to sleep and you fall over and you knock out all your teeth, then you better hope that they were covered with our dental warranty coverage. <laughs> so you should ask your dentist if they're covered with dental warranty. Welcome back to the next level, Conversations That Propel Business. We're here with our guest, Kirk Bowman, the owner of Art of Value, and you can learn more about him at artofvalue.com. Welcome back. Let's see if you can speak now, Steve. Yes, let's see. That was uh, that was a great exit, wasn't it? It's was a wonderful <laughs> dismount. Uh, Kurt, one of the things I wanted to follow back up around, um, what about scale? I mean, how do companies have customized pricing on a client-by-client -client basis and then scale their business model at the same time? So I want to just clarify, we're probably talking about professional services. Okay. And for professional services, you are trying to help each individual client achieve a specific result. So it's not like a product hmm. where you can just buy it off the shelf. Does it scale? Yes. There are advertising agencies with thousands of employees that have implemented this model. So okay. yes, it does scale. Okay. And that's one of the common objections that I hear. Is sometimes they'll say, well, that'll work for two or three or four. And fortunately, I can point to examples that show that it is true. It does scale very well. So what do you do in certain industries where the <clears throat> professional may not set the pricing? For example, you know, I'm in commercial real estate. I don't I mean, the, the industry sort of sets the commission rate. Stevens Industry Insurance, you know, the insurance companies sort of pay the same percentage, whether we like it or not. And like in, in Stevens' case, the insurance company gives the price for the policy that he then gives to his customer. So does it work with our industries or is it not really going to make sense? I think it will, and I'm actually going to use an example from a third industry that I think is applicable. I have a friend who's an eye surgeon. And so a lot of what he is paid is dictated by insurance. And he and I were having lunch after church one Sunday. And we were talking about his business. And I said, well, what you want to do is you want to create additional offerings, additional things that customers can buy. Not all of them will, but some of them will. And we were talking, and he does mostly cataract surgeries. And he came up with the idea during our conversation that probably at least half of his customers would pay to have somebody come out and put the drops in their eye, that getting the drops in their <laughs> eye was a challenge. You're kidding. And we came up with something he could offer to half his customers. He could charge a premium price. The customers were happy to pay it, and it would get him out of that kind of, you know, the industry sets the rate. And so in commercial real estate or in, you know, the insurance business, I would give similar advice. What additional value adds can you provide that customers will pay a premium for? Right. In order for them to have a premium or to pay the premium, you first have to educate them that it's available. Mm -hmm. And then, two, you have to be willing to set the price for it. Cool. And it helps your, um, in your scenario, your friend knew his customer, right? And so, I mean, that that's very, very powerful because you know what they're going to value. Bob, you just found, well, maybe me, because I blew the, the dismount on the on the hook. <laughs> but uh, I guess if it doesn't work out in insurance or radio hosting, we can go drop drops and eyes. Drops and eyes. Yeah. I have a lot of experience in that. <laughs> 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 All right. So, Stephen, you have a, a <clears throat> interesting case study we're, we're going to go with Kirk on. Yes. So, it pays to be a listener of the next level. So, we have a, a scenario... Uh, from a listener um, that was shared with me, and I probably don't have all the details right, but in theory, I'd like to just kind of go through a little bit and then get your feedback, okay? Sure, let's do it. So, digital marketing company, mm -hmm. okay, you know what they do. Uh, typical uh, agreements that are being sold is twenty-five dollars to $3,000 a month in recurring fees and rec recurring revenue. <clears throat> and it's been working. They've had a lot of success. They're growing. Things are going well in their business. 
uh, one of the big pressures that they have, there are people that um, sort of devalue the work that they do and quote lower pricing, $1,500, $2,500. And they're actually would like, they've been successful enough, they'd like to be able to to increase their prices. Um, But one of the challenges they have, and I don't have the numbers exactly right, but theoretically, you know, after, um, you know, someone's been with them, sometimes only six to 12 months, they have a, a decent fallout rate of, of clients. And, and some people really get it and they're renewed for years and that's how they've been able to grow. But in that first year, there's a number of people that uh, they believe are, are maybe not sophisticated enough despite their best expectation setting. They kind of bet the farm hoping that the digital marketing is going to just be an instant quick thing that's going to make them rich tomorrow and they can't stay with it long enough they lose their ability to stay with it and uh and so anyway to kind of throw that one out to you and and just see uh, what some of your thoughts are around that lots of good stuff in that story so i think the first thing to realize is probably some of the customers that do not renew are not really their customer And so first of all, they really need to spend some time defining who their customer really is, not who do they think will do business with them, who do they as the professional want to do business with. Mm -hmm. Write down all the characteristics. They probably have had enough customers. They know the customers they love, they can describe them to you. Mm -hmm. We call it personas in the marketing world, right? Mm -hmm. But first, start with that. Second, you want to be different. In fact, it is preferable to be different than better. Now, ideally, different will be better, but if I have a choice between the two, I'll pick different. The reason they're getting pricing pressures is because their customers are not perceiving them as different. And so they need to invest time and effort reading, thinking, going to conferences, talking to other people about how can we create a difference. One of the easy ways to do that is focus on a niche, right, or a niche, depending on how you want to say it. Bob goes niche. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, for example, are you the best at digital marketing for dry cleaners? Are you the best at digital marketing for accountants? Are you the best at digital marketing for accountants who only do tax returns? You can see how you can narrow that funnel. Mm -hmm. Also, position yourself as an expert through doing things like interviews, writing this whole content marketing, which we could do a whole show on that broad topic, Sure. but setting yourself apart as an expert. And that really boils down to educating the customer well before they ever become a customer. It's the content on your site. It's the email they get after they enter something in the contact me form on your website. Mm -hmm. It's letting them know how you do business, what you see is important, and you want the customers who are going to be attracted to what you think is important. I'm sure if we searched, we could find SEO companies that are charging two and three times what they are. And what we're going to see is they know who they want to do business with, Mm -hmm. they position themselves as an expert, and they attract those clients. So you engage with companies in a number of different ways. So what are the ways that you help people through this? Because I I actually admitted to you before we went on the show, I read Ron Baker's book, or well, two-thirds of it, and it stares at me at my nightstand every night uh, before I go to bed. So you've, I've been carrying the guilt of, of seeing you for about two years. <laughs> so what I love to do broadly is I like to help leaders of businesses, entrepreneurs, C-suite executives think bigger and think better. And how we do that is by focusing on three key concepts. What is the value we're creating for the customer? Mm -hmm. What are the options we can create to deliver more value? And then how do we price that value? That's it in a nutshell. Now, the fun thing is we get to be creative. And I love the creativity part of this. Mm -hmm. So just like I mentioned the eye doctor earlier, it was a lunch Sunday after church. And I loved it because we were just brainstorming how to do things better. I had a conversation with a software a business owner just last week and the business owner has essentially two brands and a third product that this business owner could bring to market but they thought there was a conflict of interest and I just pointed out in the conversation I said there's no conflict of interest here go for it that one light bulb moment set that entrepreneur free to pursue a whole new market that's the type of breakthrough that I love to help customers have and that's the feedback that I get from the people I've worked with. So with the art of value, how do you engage a customer? How do you price yourself? I start with a conversation. I call it a value conversation. 
typically when a customer comes to you, they're going to want to talk about what. So, for example, the digital marketing company, we want more customers. We want more leads. We, you know, They're going to have a what they want. But then I want to go beyond the what to why. Why do you want it? What's the result you're seeking? You want more customers. Well, why do you want more customers? And that may seem like a rhetorical question on the surface, but do you want it because you're trying to grow? Do you want it because you need to increase revenue? If you want to increase revenue, why do you want to increase revenue? Are you trying to sell the company? Are you trying to put your kids through college? I mean, I want to get down to why. Mm -hmm. Once you uncover why, uh, that opens up the ability for you to think creatively how to help solve the problem uniquely for that customer. So to answer your question, Bob, I start with that conversation. Okay. Once we've had that conversation, I feel like I have a clear understanding of the why. Then I create options. I offer every customer three options. There's magic in the number of three, and there's been studies in the number of three. You look at Starbucks, you know, what is it, tall, grande, vente? Yeah. You know, you go through a drive through and they offer you small, medium, and large on the value meals, right? <laughs> it's something we see. I offer them choices, and each choice has a different price. And that's how I love to work with my customers, just like I'm going to encourage them to work with theirs. And obviously, I do that through coaching, consulting, live events, and so forth. Interesting. One of the things I love that you just said is uh, making the box, I mean, essentially making the box smaller, too, is, is a way to increase your value. Um, so what are the three big insights you would give to somebody who doesn't really, you know, hasn't listened to this conversation? What are the, uh, what are the things you're going to tell us are the important things that people ought to know? So I'd say number one, I think being an entrepreneur is continuing the work of creation. And I learned this from my mentor, Ed Kless. In fact, this is his why. Kless? He said, what is Kless? What is Kless? Kless, it's a person's name. Oh. Ed, Ed Kless. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ed Kless. Ed Kless. I thought you meant at Kless. I'm like, I don't know what that is. No, Ed, Ed's a mentor of mine. And his why is he believes entrepreneurs continue the work of creation. And, of course, the three of us being Christians believe it's a spiritual endeavor. Yeah. But whether you believe in – the same faith that we do or not, however you define creation, being an entrepreneur is about creating wealth. I would say, second, that you need to have a hyper-focus on value because that's the path to success. We talk about customer service a lot and great customer service. That's a table stake. What, you want somebody who's going to provide you bad customer service? I don't focus on customer service. I focus on customer value. I go deeper. I think value is deeper than just serving, and I'm hyper-focused on it. I have what I call a value lifestyle. I am constantly thinking about value in every conversation. I take pictures of signs. I take pictures in restaurants. Anytime I see something, I said, that's a novel way to create value for a customer, so having a hyper-focus. And then I would say, three, growth happens outside the comfort zone. So the idea that if you're not scared in some area of your business, you're not pushing hard enough. Growth does not happen where you're comfortable. Growth happens where you're uncomfortable. And one of the areas where people get uncomfortable is pricing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd like to say this. If you don't need a new pair of underwear occasionally when you price, <laughs> you're not trying hard enough. Hey, I want to go real quick back to one thing you said, that this is about creating wealth. I would argue that that's a byproduct. Being an entrepreneur is about creating a solution to a need that customers have. Wealth is what happens when you've done it right. What's next? For me? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I'm really excited about this year is I'm doing some live events. So, for example, I'm going to be doing one in San Diego, another in Chicago, another in Dallas. And some of these are one day, some of these are three days, but the opportunity for people to get kind of more focused one-on-one -on -one attention with me, I'm really excited about the impact that we're going to be able to have through those. Awesome. Well, Kirk, thanks for being our guest today. We really Thank appreciate you. it. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Kirk, artofvalue.com is where to find him. If you want to learn more about the show, nextlevelshow.com is where to find us. Of course, on social media, you'll find us everywhere. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Have a great week. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.